Call the meeting to order, Central School Committee meeting uh, 505. All right, Darius. You know, Keith just brought up the same problem that yeah, uh, yeah. Shelly was having. So, Keith, can you text and can you hear us all? Keith, can you hear us so that we know you're participating? You can hear. Okay. Excellent. Um, I'm hoping you're solving that problem, Keith, is what I'm going to go forward. Moving forward, is that okay, Keith? All right. So, all right, for reorganization. So, Shelly made it in. Um, all right, so we're moving forward. Is that is that okay, Keith? You're able to participate that way right now? Keith, we're hanging on your every word. All right, the only issue I have is that we delayed reorganization yeah. last time because you weren't here and I don't want to start the reorganization without Keith here. So let's just give him a, a minute to try to sign back in. Um, anyone have any good stories? We are recorded and live. I'm just here. so glad it's not. You know, I'm always like tech is great until it doesn't work, and then it just drives me absolutely nuts. And so, it we did the uh, Deerfield tried to do an in-person meeting, and everything that could go wrong went wrong, and it was an absolute disaster. So, it was one of those days too. So. <clears throat> there he is. Hey. <laughs> I'm assuming you've nominated me for everything at this point. You are now chair. Usually like to nominate vice chair. <laughs> no, we were polite, Keith. All right, thank you. All right, so uh, first thing on the agenda is reorganization. Do I hear nominations for chair? Uh, I'm not Greg Gottschalk. Second. I have a first and second for Greg. Any other nominations? Hearing none, I'm going to close nominations. Um, I guess I do a vote to close nominations. Uh, Maisie? Yes. Jessica? Yes. Peter? Yes. Greg? Yes. Keith? Yes. Um, all those in favor for Greg to be chair of the Sunderland School Committee? Maisie? Yes. Jessica? Yes. Peter? Yes. Greg, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Point, Too late anyway. Yeah. Exactly. And Keith, yes. Greg, I hand the meeting over to you. Outstanding. All right. Uh, how about a uh, motion for a vice chair? Um, I'll nominate Jessica Corwin. I'll second. All right. Uh, let's see. I guess we're going to do the close the voting. Uh, Peter, yes. Jessica? Yes. Maisie? Yes. Keith? Yes. Greg, yes. Okay. Uh, all in favor, let's see. Uh, Maisie? Yes. Keith? Yes. Peter? Yes. Greg, yes. Jessica, it's too late, but go for it. Yes. <laughs> all right. All five. Outstanding. Um, let's see. Wow. And I'm looking, let's see, we've got secretary. I apologize. Uh, I, I squeezed into this meeting right after uh, one my wife had. And yeah, so really. I'm looking for the uh, the list of all the positions. So I'll walk you through it, Greg, to help you out. So Excellent. secretary's okay. neck and then frontier rep are the ones that you, you're going to vote on, and then you're going to appoint after that. And I'll give you the updates on each one as we go through it. Sorry, frontier rep, and what was the other one? So the, you're going to do the you're going to be voting on the secretary and the frontier rep, and then you're going to appoint moving after that. And I'll tell you as we get to each one. So right now you're looking for secretary. Outstanding. 
All right. Any uh, nominations for secretary? It has been Peter, even though tonight's agenda is yeah. right? <laughs> Um, currently, Maisie is the, currently the secretary, even though Peter's been taking the notes. Oh, okay. Sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm nominate Maisie. She's doing a great job. <laughs> okay. Second. All right. Any other nominations? All right. Uh, we'll uh, uh, vote to close the nominations. Jessica? Yes. Maisie? Yes. Peter? Yes. Keith? Yes. And Greg? Yes. And uh, let's see. Uh, all in favor of uh, Maisie? Let's see. Uh, Jessica? Yes. Peter? Yes. Keith? Yes. Greg? Yes. And Maisie? <laughs> yes. All right. Outstanding. And now Frontier Rep. Nominations for Frontier Rep? I'll nominate Keith. Yeah. I'll second that. Any other nominations? All right. Uh, move to close the vote. Let's see. Uh, Jessica? Yes. Uh, Maisie? Yes. Peter? Yes. Greg? Yes. Keith? Yes. All right. All in favor of uh, Keith, uh, Peter? Yes. Maisie? Yes. Jessica? Yes. Greg? Yes. Keith? Yes. All right. All right. So now we've got the remaining positions that are appointees. So now you have your three reps for the Union 38 representatives. Currently, it's Greg, Jessica, and Peter. Mm hmm so you're just appointing your full power, Greg. So you can ask if they want to do it, or you can tell them they have to do it. Depends on no, you. No, no. <laughs> Maisie, you were doing that for a while. You want on? Uh, no, I'm good. You're good? Yeah, everybody else okay. is still fine. And and Peter, uh, or sorry, uh, let's see. Keith, uh, you know, you have Frontier. Yeah, that's good. Uh, I'm right. sorry. All right, and then it sounds like uh, we're, we're staying where we are, uh, Peter, Jessica, and Greg. Excellent. Um, school council liaison is Green Now Maisie. Mm -hmm. Maisie, you up for that again? Yeah, that's fine. Excellent. Outstanding. The collaborative liaison is currently Keith. How do you feel about that, Keith? Uh, unless anybody's dying to do it, I'll, I'll, I'll continue. But it looks like they're dying. All right, sounds good. In negotiations right now is Greg. Is Anyone? Greg. Jessica? Uh, can we presume that it, the next time there are negotiations that it, we, it would allow observers for caucusing? I liked the role that I had last time. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I think it's good when there can be an elementary school teacher in the room with the town side but I don't need to be the one voting. Okay. All right, so uh, certainly it's, uh, you know, there's a committee that's composed of the, um, the towns and the uh, school committees, uh, and there's always a chair of that group when it, when it comes together. So I don't think I'm in a position to guarantee that, but I definitely saw the value uh, and, and I understand uh, where, you, where you kind of like that role so that I, I get where you're coming from. Um, so in that case, I'll get, I'll put myself down there for now if uh, it works for everybody. All right. Excellent. Um, and Greg, I do have um, Amanda Mosea coming on to give our update on the Anti-Racism and Equity Committee report. If you could um, be so kind of when she does come on, if we could move her right into her report find a good breaking point okay. range of report just because I pulled her, her I pulled her away from her busy schedule to, to do that tonight so just say that in the end, so so you know what's going on but all right uh, in that case uh, 
move to uh, review and approve the minutes uh, of uh, September 15th. I moved. I think there's one correction. I, I think Amanda did not go to UMass. I think she went to university in Cambridge. That is correct. Amanda went to Harvard. Can I just, uh, okay, that's cool. I will change that. I move to approve the, the minutes with that change. Outstanding. I'll second. Any other changes? All right. All in favor? Uh, let's see. Jessica? Yes. Maisie? Yes. Uh, Peter? Yes. Keith? I'm going to have to abstain at the moment. I can't see anything. Yeah, yeah. I, no, no, no. I can't get into any docs. I can't. Okay. My FRSU account, I can't get into it, so I can't see any of the documents right now. Okay. So, uh, and uh, I get it, and I'll vote yes. All right. Uh, let's uh, let's go on to the financial statements if we can, Shelley, and then if uh, uh, if we get joined in progress, we'll uh, we'll break. Um, I also cannot get into my Frontier account right now, so I have some paperwork with me, but things that I would maybe normally have access to if questions come up, I might not have access to right now because they're electronic documents. Um, but I did send out a short financial report. There's not a whole lot to update on this month unless you have questions that I didn't report on. Uh, we had 10 warrants signed electronically since the last meeting. Those totaled $59,537.53. Um, I did send the school choice and the general fund expense reports through September 30th. There's no um, general fund financial concerns at this point. You know, we have discussed some things with the revolving accounts that are on my radar as far as watching throughout the year, but there hasn't been a lot of change in the last month. We need some time to still gather um, further data. Uh, so the only big thing that I wanted to report on was the COVID expenditures because uh, most of our funding for that has been spent. We're looking at roughly about $80,000 in purchases for COVID related needs. Um, we used various funding sources to cover those expenses. Some were paid from grants, some from general funds, some from school choice. Oh, there's Amanda. I'm happy to stop and come back to it. All right. I guess we'll uh, put the give uh, Amanda the floor. You're muted. Thank you. <laughs> Um, hi, everybody. Again, um, Amanda, I'm the anti-racism and equity consultant for the district. Um, I'm here to give you some updates. So I wrote them out in another tab, so forgive me. Okay, so some updates since our last meeting. Um, things have been moving at a really quick pace at the elementary level, which is very exciting. So teachers and staff in the district have been sorted into small groups, approximately 10 people per group. Um, and they are exploring two separate topics. There's history of racism in America, and then there's white privilege and identity. Those are two kind of separate pathways that um, people are taking. They're each eight sessions, approximately an hour, 15, an hour and a half long per session. Um, history of racism in America is really expanding people's knowledge of American history to include marginalized perspectives. Um, so some of the topics that are discussed are um, how the US was founded on genocide, how the South was able to rewrite slavery and Civil War history, misconceptions of the Civil Rights Movement. So in that pathway, people are moving pretty chronologically through US history and just kind of expanding their understanding of different periods in history. Um, the white privilege and identity is a bit more self-explanatory. So the topics include understanding race as a social construct, um, white affirmative action, what that means, what that has looked like 
and color blindness. So in the small groups, teachers and staff are moving through curriculum that was developed by myself and the professional development committee. Um, and they just finished today, week four of that, week four of eight. So very exciting, a lot of positive updates. Um, from the feedback that has gotten to me, um, the biggest critique is that there's not enough time um, to do kind of, to have as in-depth conversations as people are wanting, um, which doesn't surprise me, particularly the history pathway. I, um, I designed that and I put in um, too much information because I couldn't kind of successfully filter it down <laughs> or I didn't want to. Um, so there's a lot of information that people are getting to. And I think that this serves really as an introduction. It's not the be all end all. Um, and so I think if people want to ha continue these conversations or feel like there isn't enough time, that's because this is an ongoing journey. Um, yeah, I think those are pretty much the updates. It's very exciting. I know Ben is in the history of racism pathway, so he could speak more to what it's like being in a group every week, if he so chooses. Um, but yeah, I, the feedback that I've gotten has been overwhelmingly very positive. Um, so if you all have any questions for me, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, I've got a question, and that is that, and maybe there's no answer to this yet, mm -hmm. but the year one of this whole operation, um, there inevitably will be some staff changes and certainly there will be student changes for next year and the succeeding years. Mm -hmm. um, is there some thought to, to how, I don't assume you're also not going to start over from scratch each year. And I was just wondering what your thoughts were about that. How did yeah, you? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, something that has come up in the various groups that are involved in kind of planning this is thinking about new staff orientations so that new people coming in will also kind of get a baseline understanding of the work that has been done in the district. Um, and I think that's, a, it's, I mean, that's just been an idea that's sort of been floated, but I think it's a really powerful one. And I think it's definitely one worth pursuing. Um, yeah, so that's just, that is just one. I have no authority to speak to <laughs> um, that more in depth, but as far as conversations that I have been a part of, that's something that's come up and I think will be pursued in, in earnest going forward. Um, yeah. And then thinking about kind of student changes and what this looks like, I think this is why it's so important that this is a really a district-wide initiative. I'm really working with the elementary schools, um, but there is kind of continuity of understanding across every level of the district. And I think that's really important so that students are not gonna have one teacher who's super passionate about this and then get another teacher the next year who's less engaged. I think there's, the flow will be more continuous, ideally, in kind of engaging teachers and thus engaging students, which that is a roundabout answer to say, I have no idea, but <laughs> I think co those conversations are starting to happen, which I think is really great. And I think people are really thinking about this long-term, which I think is essential. Um, in order to do this work well, it has to be done constantly and mistakes have to be made and then learn from and the work goes on. And I think that's that sentiment is shared by everyone I've worked with, which has been really great. So thank you for that answer or that question, Peter. I hope you'll forgive my answer in which I have no specifics for you. But I don't expect that. I just <laughs> it just struck me this wasn't like an eight week program and then we're all done and we just don't do anything ever more. And yeah if nothing else people rotate out of the system and new people rotate in and mm -hmm. plus obviously i'm sure stuff needs refreshing stuff needs 
you know, whatever. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I think it's, this is an ongoing process. About the school committee. Are we, uh, are we uh, going to get a little education? Whoa, I would love that. <laughs> I think so. Um, I I don't know what that would look like with you guys, um, but I would love to be a part of that for sure. Yeah, maybe sometime. I mean, I I you know it's it, it's in all of society, so it's got to be dealt with in all of society. And... Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fantastic. I think so. Um, so maybe you know, I mean, I'm not saying tomorrow or something, but it's something. <laughs> yeah. You know, really missing. If I'm wrong, but didn't Frontier kind of ask that as well? Frontier School Community. Yep. Um, so we're looking into what what can we do that would be meaningful for the school committees and how it can fit in with the with everything else that's going on. So I'm hoping to be able to come back with that as well. So yes, it was asked. It was asked kind of. I think I think every district almost asked that on the first time um, last 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 month rather. I, I had just a couple process, thought process questions because I'm kind of engaged in this in Amherst, so I just just interested to see how. So this is it's mainly with staff and faculty this year. Is that right? Um, yes. So right now the the kind of thought process is faculty staff are taking kind of these eight weeks for this, this part of the year to do very kind of personal individual work of kind of like what privileges have I experienced in society or what have I learned that is false that I need to now unlearn. So that's sort of the, the pr thought process for this term um, with the, the eight weeks really in-depth work. And then I think going forward next year, next, well, in this starting in the new year, we'll have to think about, I think, kind of implementing this. What does this look like with students, curriculum changes, really looking at libraries and who's missing, um, things like that. So that's, I think, kind of the projection that I have <laughs> um, for kind of starting in January. And then um going beyond that i mean the work will will be continuing um so that's but that's what it's looking like right now yes yeah, but that, that's what i would kind of assume that the teachers would be kind of trained first staff trained first it would, it's a lot of hard work and then they would begin to implement that in their classroom probably mm -hmm. see it more so next year but my question is and i, I just honestly don't know i'm just really curious um it's hard work is there a significant difference at all, the approach between the, because I'm, I'm engaged at, at the secondary level, is there a difference between this approach at elementary level as opposed to the secondary level in engaging with this work? Um, I can speak less to what this is looking like on the secondary level, um, but I know there's been more structure coming from the elementary, it looks like. Um, that's not to say that there isn't any structure for secondary, but it's just looking different. Elementary, it's like every week on Wednesday from this time to this time, you're going to be in small group work um, versus secondary doesn't quite have such a rigid structure. But I think secondary, what they're doing is they're going to be working with um, UMass, I think is the plan, um, and working with consultants and creating a partnership um, with one of the um, schools there to ensure that this is not only long term, but there's a lot, it's very data driven. Mm -hmm. um, and that's sort of on this, on the elementary level, that's kind of what I'm doing. Um, so laying the foundation, kind of collecting data mm -hmm. in the form of surveys and things like that. So I think the structure is looking different. I think the timeline is also looking different um, because elementary isn't, you know, trying to form a partnership with UMass per se. They're mm -hmm. able to move faster on this. Um, and 
So the timelines are looking a little different, but I think overall the the goal is definitely the same. And I think the longevity of this is the same on both levels. Um, I hope that I hope that kind of an answered your question. So it is looking different, okay. definitely. But I think things are coming together on both ends. Yeah. All right. I think it's important to really, I mean, Amanda talked a lot about tonight, the what's going on with the professional development, but we, you know, there's the four pillars. So the other work from the other committees are still going forward. So you know um, the policy in you know committee and looking at handbooks and our language around how we deal with with um, race and how we deal with culture within our schools is being looked at you know meanwhile you know curriculum committee is looking at that as well so we kind of focused on that what we're doing within our professional development but we have the other pillars that are also that work is continuing as well so you know for instance i have a meeting I don't know when I have my next meeting with the policy committee where we're going through the handbooks and trying to look at how we're approaching language, what's missing, what's, you know, what do we need to add and looking at, you know, other handbooks that have better, um, better tone and, and um, addressing issues of racism and that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of other work happening at the same time with the professional development. So um, and just kind of, I just wanted to point that out. And I think I can, uh, uh, for Frontier, you know, they, they are they just kind of uh, Sarah just finished up the partnership with with UMass there was a lot of back and forth as they were trying to get up and running and we were getting up and running so um, I imagine at the frontier meeting um, she can give a complete overview of where what well, how is that's going to roll out and what they're going to be going on but it is going to be again intensive more intensive moving forward at this point because they're talking about having five five meetings and what's going to happen in those meetings and so forth so I don't have the details of that in front of me but um, it's being put together. So Keith, I can make sure that happens at Frontier meeting. Sorry, sorry, just quickly. Uh, you mentioned four pillars. What are the, what are the four pillars? The four pillars are, so we're going to do a wrap top of my head. We have curriculum, professional development, policy, and school culture. Okay, school culture, outstanding. Right. So the school culture is then also that's getting up and running too. Now the students, we have the students back and that kind of thing. So, and that's looking, it looks different at the secondary than it does at the elementary as well as they're trying to figure out how to you get the student groups were more at the secondary than in the elementary, but um, they're launching that as well. All right. Uh, well, if no one else has anything else, thank you so much, Amanda, for the update and uh, looking forward to hearing more. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, everyone. Have a great evening. You as well. Thank you. Uh, and I see, Darius, I saw Kim McCarthy was on, or are we? Uh, let's... Oh, she left. Oh, she's left. All right. So I guess we'll, we'll go back to Shelly then. Okay, so I think I was on a uh, grant and COVID related update. So we've spent around $80,000 from various funding sources. Um, there is still some grant money remaining, not much, but there's definitely a little bit there for um, Ben and I to discuss what the needs are for between now and December. Um, and then we recently submitted requests to all of the towns, including Sunderland for reimbursement through the Municipal CARES Act funding. Um, we submitted for $70,000 in reimbursement, plus an additional $30,000 of items that we have not yet purchased. They're sort of um, wish list items, you know, where, where Chromebooks are coming back damaged faster than we can keep up with. Um, so if we could order backup Chromebooks instead of having just the one-to-one, -one, it allows us to replace them out as they're damaged. Um, there's also a higher need for faculty and staff to have access to Chromebooks than we've had in the past. So that's something that we're looking at. Um, we did request an additional PPE and cleaning order, supply order. Um, so if we could get reimbursement, it would be pretty significant and relieve funds that we've already used from the general fund and from school choice funds. Um, and then we'd still have our grant fund remaining. Uh, the Town administrators have had a dialogue through email with Darius and I, as well as some phone meetings. Um, I know that their preliminary applications were due for um, this second round, I think by tomorrow. Um, so they were gonna look at their town expenses and the school expenses. 
I believe Sunderland is asking for the full amount and then they'll go back and amend based on spending and then whatever they don't spend by the end of the calendar year, they will have to return. So um, I'll follow up with the town administrator next week to see where we're at and what we're approved for. Um, it looks like we're going to have to prepay and then get reimbursed for things versus the town just paying for it, which we didn't necessarily know in the beginning. But I think I don't think that that's an issue. Um, so I'm happy to take questions if you have them, but that's really about all that I have tonight. I just want to tell you, and that is that if assuming this uh, CARES Act funding comes through, um, then the items that we have paid for up to now through grants, in effect, the bookkeeping would flip that over to get it covered by the CARES funding. And so those grants would then still have the money available in them, correct? It depends on the grant. Um, so we have a couple of different grants that have come in for COVID. And if the grant runs through Frontier, the books are not connected because Frontier is a separate entity than Sunderland. So I can't actually move money that way, which is why more recently I started paying things from school choice because I didn't want to get too far deep where we couldn't get that grant money back. Right. So, you know, a lot of the money that we've spent so far is from general fund account lines or school choice account lines. And what we would do is replenish those accounts so that normal purchases could be made. For instance, technology has these recurring expenses that are year to year for different things. And this is not COVID related, just regular tech needs to keep us functioning. Well, we've used some of that money to buy extra technology things, whether it's webcams, whether it's additional software, um, Chromebooks, things like that. We would be able to replenish that so that the general fund or the school choice funds would become available again. But the grants are a little bit more tricky. Um, the way that the state does a lot of their funding, it doesn't go to all of the towns individually. It funnels into Frontier and then Frontier pays out the money which is also interesting because then the towns have to pay frontier back so it's really complicated um but we would hopefully be able to recoup a good chunk of money and get it back into accounts that we'll still use this year okay and and where i've seen signing warrants a number of things that look like it's new software for example dealing with the the, the different circumstances now um that sort of stuff would be that would be uh, up for reimbursement correct Absolutely, if we get approved for it, yep. Yeah, okay. there's like four categories. There's a cleaning, there's the PPE, there's social distancing, and then school distance learning. So anything technology related, um, tent rentals, table purchases, all of that is sort of falling under the school distance learning, you know, which doesn't necessarily mean remote learning. It's just the way that we've had to structure school this year so that we can you know, maintain that six feet apart and smaller classroom sizes, et cetera. We had to buy some cafeteria materials and equipment so that the cafeterias could deliver lunches to classrooms. You know, so everything looks a little bit different, but we've submitted a, a big, big list. And like I said, it's, you know, about 70,000 in reimbursement and then 30,000 that if we can get funded for it, tech, it's mostly technology, we'll go ahead and place a second order for Chromebooks, laptops, things like that. Yeah, no, my, I recollect Blackboard meet, uh, a week ago was that they didn't, they were, Sunderland had been told they were eligible for 200000 of this CARES money, and they didn't have like, you know, didn't sound like they thought we would spend the whole thing, but since the state allowed you to just claim the whole thing and then pay back what you didn't use, that's what they were planning on doing, so that there may be less competition for that money than one might normally expect. And so, you know, the school might make out better than one might expect. Yeah, fingers crossed that we'll go ahead and, and get, if not most of that, or if not all of it, most of it reimbursed to us, which frees up other funds for other needs. I got one more suggestion on something that I just think ought to be reimbursable, and that is we changed out the carpet in the, uh, some of the rooms in the school over the summer, I believe. I'm sure we did that to make COVID-related cleaning more easy. Um, I'm wondering if that could fall under the reimbursable list. 
Um, certainly something to look at. I mean, that's money we got from the town's capital account, but if we ended up not having to spend it, the town wouldn't have been. Yeah, I think the only um, tricky part, and I would want to talk to Jeff about it, is that it was budgeted in the town's capital expenditures for this year, and you're not supposed to use these funds for any budgeted expense, whether it's the municipal side or the school side. So, you know. Even though that was done after COVID was already a fact. Yeah, it's a, if it was in their budget already and they get audited, it could be problematic for them. I toss them out, you swat them down, that's okay. <laughs> Sorry, it's a good idea. <laughs> Any other questions, COVID or budget finance related? Thank you. The governor uh, released uh, the, the updated, do you want to just talk about that, Shelley? Did you have a chance to look at that? I know it came out like at three or four this afternoon. Yeah, so when I tried to get in, the, the governor released a updated um, budget uh projection is that what they're calling it i don't have the exact language that dls put out but basically they updated the cherry sheets with his new um advised is that what you said they're calling it the governor's advised. budget um and when i when the email first came out they must have been flooded the dls website was just spinning and spinning and spinning so i actually couldn't get in to look at the cherry sheets but it's on my list to do um and, get out some updates and see where it stands and hopefully it's not too painful but it would have updated um chapter 70 numbers you know obviously not finalized because the state hasn't voted but updated um chapter 70 school choice uh those are probably the two biggest things that are impactful for us it'll also say what the town pays out which will be good for us to know what they pay out for school choice even though it doesn't technically come out of school budget if their number is significantly increasing then you know that could have an impact if not this year then next year so um i haven't had a chance to look at it in great detail yet Shelly, i'm looking at it right now a governor's revised budget proposal and it says chapter 70, uh, 5,000 less than what was in the original budget one, 872,000 instead of 877. Which my guess with that is that they're gonna pull the I, SOA money out. I think that they're pulling back on the Student Opportunity Act funding, which for a district like ours at this point is a good thing because it's a small amount of money. You know, some districts you know, around us that are gonna lose hundreds of thousands of dollars, some of them a million dollars plus. Um, whereas it was not good when the SOA money came out and we weren't getting a whole lot, but now we're at a point where if they're gonna take it away, it's not gonna have a significant negative impact. So um, I, and I'll have to look into it in greater detail. That number and also the town's unrestricted general government aid are both level funded now from FY20. So that's not bad at all. So the, the guidance I got from the uh, Massachusetts Association of Superintendents said that basically this is the similar to the report that came out in, at the end of July with some with some adjustments from to the more impoverished communities where they did some um, adjustment of numbers, but the numbers are similar. So remember, it's just the governors have still got to go through everything else, but it kind of at least it's not it's not as terrible as they're saying it's not, you know, he's putting forward a pretty um, not a devastating budget. This again, this is this year's budget. <laughs> so remember, usually we're starting to think about next year at this point in time, and we're still working on again this year. So that's just a reminder. So um, we'll digest that, but I just wanted to put that out there because I know it's hot off the press. And now Peter's going to read that the entire meeting. Just to just joke, Peter. You're a numbers guy. You like that stuff. <laughs> Kelly, I got a quick question about transportation. I don't know if you have the, the numbers in front of you, but it looks like, I mean, just that we're going through really quickly. I don't know what. Transportation. Yeah. I mean, uh, regional and then SPED. I mean, the regional looks like there's like 14% left. And, like, and then so transportation itself says there's like 39% left and it's really early in the school year. So I'm just wondering if that's being used for other things or like where. Yeah, where so we what we do is allocate out um, for the whole school year, what we think our expenses are gonna be on an expense like this. And special education transportation can certainly um, 
change at any time. So those funds we protect if, you know, right now it says there's 32,000 remaining in uh, special education transportation. So we'll hold on to those until we're much closer to the end of the year and then move them around if we need to. Um, okay. The regional, the regular transportation, I'm not sure why that says regional, I should change that coding in there because it's really regular education. Um, Darius, we're going to talk about the MOA in executive session, correct? So um, there will be some more details on that when we go into executive session. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. If nothing else, Eric, uh, I don't know if you got, uh, was there any public comment that, that went your way? I didn't receive anything. Nope, Donna contacted me at around four and said there was she'd received. Fair enough. All right. In that case, uh, let's see. Update on school opening. So it sounds like part of the principal's report. So yeah, I just wrote it that way because Ben's going to give an update, but it's also kind of his principal's report. So just know that he's not probably not going to give a principal's report later. I don't know how you want to do it, Ben, but you want to give us the. Give us the good news. What how was opening? Uh, opening has gone very, very smoothly. And um, and really that's uh, attributed to the flexibility of our, our families and the uh, hard work our, our teaching staff has has put in. At, at this point in time, we have um, pre-K through six, 80 students who are doing fully remote. For our hybrid students, pre-K through six, we have a 104. And we do have some students, a handful of students, who are attending four days a week. And pre-K through six, that number is 45 total. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I gave another update uh, at our last school committee meeting. But I do want to um, recognize one group of individuals who are absolutely so imperative to how we um, conduct our business at the school from both an instructional and operational standpoint. And that, uh, that's our instructional assistants. And really, they are the, the meat and bones of the, of the school. Um, they, uh, they served on various committees this past spring and over the summer. And their hard work has really helped to ensure a smooth transition. They've routinely gone above and beyond. And we would not have experienced the success that we have up to this point uh, without their hard work. So their, their efforts are commendable and so appreciated. I, I think I had mentioned at our last meeting that we have tents outside. We have an early childhood tent. We have a tent for one of our specialized programs. And then we have a grade level tent uh, for each, for grades K through six, one each. And teachers have been accessing those throughout the week. And it's uh, it's been going really smoothly. Um, so all in all, it's uh, it's been pretty good. And I notice I'm losing batteries and I need to run upstairs to get my charger. So. Outstanding. Um, yeah. I can, I'll, I'll be right back and um, then can answer any questions. Absolutely. All right. All right. Thank you. And, and absolutely. Uh, uh, thanks to everyone, and especially the IAs, as Ben mentioned. Um, all right. Uh, let's see. We have uh, under new business, um, MCAS conference, nominate an, an official delegate. Is that, are, are yep. we sending anyone there? Go ahead. So basically, this year is a virtual meeting, and we have an official voting delegate. So you don't need to attend the. Um, Oh, it's been updated. You don't need to attend all of the MASC conference, but I need a delegate that, um, if someone wants to, um, attends the Saturday at one o'clock. There's going to be a joint conference where the if there's any voting to occur, it would be Saturday, November seventh at one o'clock. So whoever signs up for it kind of has to. It was Friday at like three, and I think they on the they changed it since now and last week when I'm Deerfield voted their um, people to go. So um, anyways, it's, remember this is the conference that 
some of you have attended down in, in, in on the, I guess they call it the CAPE conference for school committee members. Now it's a virtual conference. Um, I don't know if there's anything hot that's being um, voted on this year. Uh, we're supposed to have a delegate that's the official voting for that. So I don't know if anybody's planning on attending and wants to be that voting delegate, but I need to send someone along. If no one's going, we've had districts, you know, because there's five districts here, we send one rep. Um, we've had districts who have not sent people to this conference. It's not the end all be all, but um, it's an interesting experience. <clears throat> and again, you say we have five districts and we send one rep? All five of our districts send one rep. Ah, so okay. you're, you're, what I'm saying is if nobody can make it's a Saturday afternoon. And so if yeah. nobody can make it on November 7th to go, you know, you can try to get someone to sign up. If you can't make it, it's not they're not yeah. voting to, you know, change the world at their change education as we know it at this meeting. Um, I'd be curious how they're going to do it as a virtual. It'll be interesting how they're going to do the speakers and that kind of stuff. But anyway, um, I'm just saying that thing because I'm hearing quietness. And so I don't want anybody to feel yeah. um, if no one does this. It's you know, the end of the world, but. <clears throat> Any interest out there? All right, I'll tell you what, so I, I can spend a Saturday afternoon. What I would recommend, Greg, is I'll sign you up for it. I'll yep. put your name down on it. We'll get the agenda. Yep. Then after review of the agenda, if you feel it's necessary to have a, our voice at the table, then you can make a choice to attend at that time. If the agenda is, you know, if they're voting to what salad dressings they have next year, then maybe that's not something that we need to do, you know. Uh, Sounds good. All right. <clears throat> all right. Uh, snow days, we're going to discuss only? <laughs> yes. So um, this is one of those weird, this is one of those weird things where we have the ability, the, the commissioner has sa said that a snow day can be a remote day. And so I'm just getting feedback from school committees. Um, on this, I'm not sure officially if it's the school committee decision or is it my decision. It's being done different ways in different districts, and there's no real guidance on who makes the decision of how we go that route. Um, so I'm just kind of collecting information. I'll be honest, I think I don't, you know, Keith, you were there at Frontier. I think Frontier wanted nothing to do with it, they just kind of <laughs> gave me input. They said, You make the decision. Um, but I, the idea is so basically, the commissioner is allowing you to have remote days on snow days. And the question is, I'm just kind of getting people's thoughts on, did we just, you know, the state of Rhode Island made it a lot easier on its schools. They just said all snow days are remote days moving forward. Done, you know, for this year. Um, they didn't do it. They kept it local controlled and make it interesting and keep us busy. Um, so, you know, I'm just kind of looking for feedback and just kind of to point out some of the problems that within this thing is that, even though last year we only had three snow days, we had a lot of delays, I kind of like in the delay king in the area. Um, delays really don't work well in our system, especially when you're teaching both remote and in person and waiting for people to come and go. Um, and, and then even so we are connected to the secondary and it's even more difficult in the secondary how they have it set up. Um, so you're actually talking about maybe up to, you know, five, six, seven, eight of these days. So where, you know, you may have a small washout you know, um, kind of thing uh, versus the the idea of the majestical snow day of eight inches on the ground and the poor kids won't be able to go outside and make a snowman. Um, there is the concern that teachers teaching remotely may not have internet or there could be internet outages. Yep. What do you know? The perfect timing of the wind day. Um, we call it the wind day, the wind day of 2000, um, where we lost, you know, we missed school because of the wind. Um, and the power outages due to that, you know, those kind of things may require a shutdown. Um, and so it's not just the student's ability to, to get up and running. It's also the teacher's ability to get up and running. There are ways to counter that. We can do blizzard bags and there can be remote learning with, um, you know, remote learning that doesn't have, can be asynchronous rather than synchronous live learning, um, where teachers could set up in advance. Most of our snow days don't sneak up on us every now and then we'll get a Monday that snuck up on us. But, you know, the, you know, the day before a snow day, people are at my door all day long. What's it going to be? What are you going to do? You know, like people have an idea. So I think teachers can be somewhat prepared and say, um, get students prepared as well. So anyways, I'm just looking for thoughts from school committee. Um, you just kind of get each, I thought it would be a good way to a also communicate. This is our way of communicating with the public as well, that there's a lot of thought in this. It does affect, 
I mean, the other side of it is that if you suddenly shut down for a two hour delay day and, you know, the family was depending on the school as childcare that day, it, it, you know, we're sending 1500 lives upside down whenever we change someone's schedule on a moment's notice. So it's, it is a serious thing um, as well. So, and I just kind of getting different feedback on that. So feedback. I would just, I, I would assume but I'll say it anyway, I will assume that you will do your normal collaboration with the staff because, you know, it's again, it's a new circumstance. And so whatever working condition issues there might be, just to make sure that they're addressed, you know, beforehand in a collaborative way so that no, you know, walking away from this thing pissed off. Yep. I Because I think that attitude has been, you know, fundamental key thing towards... Uh, you know, what well, What Ben talks about, smooth opening of the school. So you don't do that because the administration is dictating what gets done. You do that because people are working together to figure out the best way to do stuff. So that goes for this too. Thank you. Yeah, I didn't really have feedback so much as a, a clarifying uh, question. Uh, so you said it's, it's really hard with this current setup uh, to have a day where everyone's remote. And I, I think I get what you're saying, but I just want to make sure I get my head wrapped around it. So if you had planned to have a bunch of people come into the building and now you're trying to do remote, like no, I just for us to do a two hour delay. To, okay. So there may be times where we get that the slippery start to the day where a two hour delay would have been where I would probably be moving more toward a remote day that day, um, which you know the ink the you still have that inconvenience to the parents. The way two hour delays work for elementary, it's gotta be an inconvenience to parents. By the time the kids get to school, it's like 10 o'clock, you know? So mm -hmm. it, it's nothing, there's nothing easy about those days on people, but it is, um, you know, it's stuff that I consider and I want people to know that I, I stress about that stuff. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot bigger stresses lately, but I did stress about that in the previous years. <laughs> So I, we did discuss this at, at the Frontier meeting and I, I was in agreement with kind of what they said about uh, the two hour delay, get rid of it and that becomes uh, a remote day. And, and I can see the logistics, it's a logistical nightmare trying to move, especially when you got hybrid going on. But then I was like, I think they said they had a certain romanticism for the snow day. Um, and I, for me, it's like, you know, if we can do the work, let's do the work. But then I was thinking like, well, any any time we get a weather forecast that has like bomb in it, like those bomb bombs or like the bomber, then we probably just have the snow day. If we get like a foot or more, and it just shuts everything down, and then power. But I think I was leaning towards the remote as well. No delays. And I and I've heard all that, and so like I said, I'm getting feedback from all the school committees. I got two more after this one, so. I don't want to say where I'm kind of leaning already because then that would not give everybody their feedback. So I want to make sure I get all the feedback before I make a decision. But yeah, some kind of balance in there, I think, is it probably going to be an appropriate. appropriate I don't personally have a strong opinion on this, but have you also solicited input from the, the union? From the I teachers? brought it up at negotiations of both of them and asked what their thoughts are. And so um, the Frontier Association was like strong to just do remote. We're going to get more from our students this time of year than in in, in June. Um, 38 was uh, very a lot of concerned about whether or not they'll have their materials. A lot of the teachers are teaching from the classroom where they have setups and that kind of stuff. And will they be able to adjust in time um, and trying to make sure they can work out those details? So um, it's you know working on those details. So we are we are talking with them as well. Uh, yeah, I would say I have no problem with snow days being remote, but I do like the idea of balance, um, especially because this is kind of a big switch midstream. But yeah, as long as communication is great, I don't, no problem with it. Right. I agree. And, we, and, and I think was for those listening, even talking with some of the teachers, the elementary teachers about this, you know, your snow day activities can include, you know, getting outdoors and having fun in the snow. You know what I mean? There, there can be fun things that can be built into a lesson plan and doing that other stuff if, you know. Um, and then again, also, if we got a foot of snow, I think that's going to be power outages and that kind of stuff. And that would be probably leaning more toward canceling on days like that if people can't access at all or don't have electricity or have other responsibilities. So, yeah, anyway, I think it's a good discussion. Thank you. Yeah. 
All right. Uh, I guess then we'll move on to the the policies, the harassment policy, first reading, and the uh, so yeah. The so yeah, the first one, the harassment policy, it's a long one in front of you, and it's an important one. It's a new law that was changed. And so um, I'll give you the highlights of what's changed from our previous policy in this. Um, basically, it's narrowing the definition of sexual, sexual harassment under Title IX. Um, it's limiting the obligation to investigate complaints only to conduct those occurred on, in the school's program or activity, not related to off-campus conduct. Um, the manda mandatory response and obligation of the schools in providing supportive measures. Um, it's changed to, to the standard for school liability. Again, these are all the within the law that within the changes that are respected to the law. More detailed grievance procedures that will alter the way schools process and respond to complaints. The hearings are optional um, and written requests are required. Uh, schools may choose the standard what standard of evidence to use, uh, either preponderance of evidence or clear and convincing evidence. Um, schools must offer both parties an appeal um, from a determination regarding responsibility. So. This is heavy legal language. Anytime we get into one of these issues, I'm in, I'm in conflict with our legal counsel to make sure that we go through one of these investigations properly. We don't have a full HR department that, that runs these things. We have to use our other administrators um, to fulfill the roles under Title IX. Um, when you go through, we go through it, I guess tonight's the first reading. If you have questions, I may be able to answer them, but I'm also may have to contact legal counsel. So if you go through it, um, again, this, this did come from our attorney. Um, there was also the MASC put out a version as well. The difference from our attorney's version and the MASC's version is that the MASC, MASC's version um, did not have the option for the victim in these to not be present in the um, in the hearing. And so you had to face the accuser um, had to face the victim had to face um, the accused and that the attorney did not like that language and did not feel the law required that and wanted more protections on um, that thing. So that's the biggest difference between the policy you see in front of you and what the MASC um, originally sent out to us. So um, again, it's a re first time to read through. It's a heavy read. And again, it's one of those things where um, we have to have it by law. So if we want to change it, um, let me know and then I'll contact the attorney if there's issues or concerns within it that you're confused by or like to see different, let me know and I can see what you can do. But It is an important one overall though, because it is one of those where we have a liability to protect. It's for all people, it's for students, faculty, staff, volunteers, the, all the people that we have to protect within our within our district, um, for, you know, from such, um, from such things, I guess. Do you think this is an improvement on the old policy? You know what the biggest change that I saw that I think is an improvement is the person that is the Title IX coordinator doesn't do all the investigation and the determination. So somebody else is doing the investigation. So if there's a blind spot, especially in a smaller district like ours, it's not going to be you're having one person do an investigation and another person overseeing the investigation. So to me, I think that's the, the greatest uh, change that I saw when I read through it in how we operate in that. So yeah, I like that. Um, it also, the removal that we're not responsible for stuff that doesn't happen under our watch. You know, I think that's that that helps a little bit. So if they also, the procedures in it, if you saw the last page, they kind of, they kind of gave, gave procedures and how to conduct those things. Um, the one information, the one feedback I got from another committee was, can we remove the names of who are they and then write that they can be found on the district's website so that we don't have to revote this every single time I have an administrator change in the district. Um, so, and that people can find that information online. So I thought that was good feedback out of the gate from, can't give credit to the school member who gave it because I forgot who did it, but somebody did out there and I thought that was a good point. Outstanding. So yeah, first, else? the second one is Another revising of our um, public comment policy. Um, Google has um, improved some of its securities and talking with other um, 
people, the idea of being able to invite, if someone wants to come and speak to the committee directly, they just simply ask you to be invited for the, you know, the address. Um, they can be sent out to them. So basically members of the public who like to speak during public meeting may request a meeting um, invite via email. Either of the above methods should be submitted no later than 3 p.m. the evening of the meeting. Um, um, and then the email address um, will be provided um, in the posting notice for each meeting. So the idea that people can provide it in writing, and that was brought up at the Conway meeting, which was a good point, really pushing for people to provide written stuff that also allows, we talk about restricting access. Someone brought up the opposite is occurring. By allowing these written things, if someone can't make a meeting time, they can still get their thoughts made out to the public, um, um, you know, to you, to you folks rather, and give input on stuff, even if they work evenings or trying to log in and do all this kind of stuff is a little much. Um, and then we have the ability for people to come in person if they want to um, be here. So that's the that's the update. The idea of the phone system, doing it five different ways for five different committees, I couldn't figure out a way to, to do that effectively. Um, and so this was kind of one where I thought, hey, this kind of, this kind of meets that, that person who wants to come to the meeting. So, um, outstanding. So you can do a reading on that, or you could wave, and then I don't know. Did we put that a wave and vote on this one? I forget what our reels did. Um, the first reading. Yeah. Yeah, it's his first reading. So read on that, and you can give me feedback um, as well. And we're effectively already doing it, right? We are. So there's no reason that we need to hasten it by waving the readings and so. Good point. We are already doing it because I think it, it increased access. And that was one of the biggest things, you know, the written only what I heard from school committee was we need increased access. And I said, well, let me just throw that again, an emergency change, knowing that I really wasn't going to get in trouble for that, you know, providing more access. But you're right. Jesse. It does say first reading. And I think we have to follow our agenda. So. Thank you for the revisions. I, I'm, I'm pleased with the changes. Outstanding. All right. Uh, it sounds like uh, maybe the next thing on the agenda is to move to a, uh, my apologies, an executive session. So you could do, if you want, we have to come back into a uh, regular session to vote that. Um, do you want to just go through the rest of the reports so it's the ease of the Let's viewer? We just then because you're going to do yeah. one single vote after. Absolutely. So we didn't do that last time, but what I have to do is I have to stop recording. And then people yeah. are watching live. All of a sudden, they don't know when they come back and that kind of stuff. So um, the next thing are just the reports. Um, so the chair. Then yeah. are you all set in yours? Um. I was just going to talk about the upcoming events. So next week we have a remote PTO meeting and uh, we've, we've actually also started a biweekly material pickup for our remote families. Um, so that uh, that's been up and running for a couple times now and families come on a scheduled day every two weeks and they receive a coat, a tote canvas bag with, uh, learning at home learning materials for those two weeks and then when the next time comes around they exchange it we have our walk and roll to school days scheduled for october 22nd and 23rd and we're doing it by cohort so cohort a is on the 22nd cohort b is on the 23rd and for those families who are remote just like we held our walk and roll to school day this past uh this past spring we're asking those families to send in submissions of their students being outside and getting some form of physical activity. And uh, let's see, voting day on November 3rd, Veterans Day on November 11th, and that's about it. Hey, Ben, um, I misspoke at, this, at, this, at the Frontier School Committee that you had set up the lunches to be delivered to the apartments because we had a number of families in need who were in trouble with transportation and picking up on the off days. And I know you were working on that. Anything for the public on that? Where we're, we're on that update? Yeah, we're going to start meal delivery to the Cliffside Apartments and uh, another location in town starting next Monday on the 19th. So that's up and up and running. 
you know, the big, the big difference last with last spring was that, you know, all, all the teachers were remote and instructional support staff. So we were able to come up with a, a long list of, of volunteers to make that happen. I have had some families reach out to me uh, and express an interest in helping with meal delivery if need be. And we might call upon some of those families if we're, if we're in a crunch. But for now, it's going to be starting up on this coming Monday and will take place every Monday and Wednesday from here on out. Thank you. Yep. We go to superintendent's report, Greg. Yes, please. All right. Uh, sorry, I sent out today. I forget when I set things out to people because I sent them out last week to the other school committees. Um, within my report, the school improvement plans, I'm, I'm asking that we put this on hold until December. Um, the administration has been obviously overwhelmed with the, the multiple reopenings of different models um, and really hasn't had time to work on that. I think a lot of our school improvement plans are going to be looking at a lot of the work we're already doing, but um, you know, I, I would expect to see that in December. Um, Meg Birch, who we hired as a part-time nurse leader um, last year through a grant, um, due to the issues around COVID and um, tracking all the issues that COVID has brought to our community, I've, I've hired her on as a full-time nurse leader for this year. Um, and you know, we're trying to figure out how to pay that by increasing the, the sum in the grant. If that gets approved, that'll be great. And then if it isn't, we're gonna have to pay for that off of uh, from our general budget line. So that's an additional expense, but I do need the position tracking and communicating with our different public. We have different public nurses. We have different boards of health. It's a lot of coordinations and it's a lot of, we do a lot of tracking of different, um, you know, cases that aren't even cases yet. You know, when someone's going to get tested, whether it's a staff member or a student or a family and doing a lot of follow up there. So we're, we're watching all those. And so having her um, do that and then provide guidance to families um, who may have to be either quarantining for somebody else or, you know, for their own illnesses or that kind of stuff is, has been, um, has been, uh, I, I definitely need her help. Um, and then also communicating that out, the staff, the different issues around COVID and, and that kind of thing. So um, we moved forward on that. I made a kind of an executive decision since I am an executive. Um, <laughs> I am meeting, I met with the town administrators, the four town administrators last week. We are talking about the different school financing, um, the COVID funding, and um, we're going to have an interesting budget year ahead, which can take a lot of communications with the towns as the 22 budget, when that gets released, which will be uh, much further. Um, obviously, it's going to be probably later spring since everything's going to be delayed, but um, there's going to be a lot of co We're going to need a lot of cooperation this year more than ever as um, the, the towns are going to try to balance their budgets out. So we, we, we met last week and we're going to continue those. I do meet every other week with the boards of health um, uh, in a, on a call. We're also with police, EMS, and the town officials and um, nurse leaders in those towns on those calls as well, where we talk about what's going on from flu clinics, the school safety, the opening plans, and then obviously trends in our community. I'm also talking with boards of health members, um, even more so, like I'm almost um, several days a week sometimes, um, depending on if there's cases or concerns in the community. Um, so that's just a, um, I am still part of the new superintendent induction program, although I, I think I'm one of the veterans in Franklin County now. Um, and I just want to kind of let you know that I'm still continuing to do that. And the focus, um, it continues to be equity in schools. And then they obviously have added on reopening schools in the COVID environment and supporting us in that. Um, I wanted to throw out there, you know, uh, Ben thanked people with donations. Um, there just have been a lot of donations where um, even small things that have really helped so much in our schools. And then, um, I mean, just last week, I did. We received 2,500 masks from the Rotary of Franklin County, um, and I just wanted to thank the the Bezio family who orchestrated that donation. And there's been so many others. I know Ben has mentioned them, so I'm sure I'm going to leave other people out. But I just want to thank all that. And then the ongoing things, um, you know, that we're working on. Um, I just wanted to highlight the within the the racism, anti-racism and equality, the the the, uh, the uh, administrative team has, has come up with its own uh, PD plan as well. Um, last week we met with uh, 
uh, Dr. Elizabeth Pryor from a professor at Smith College, who uh, gave us, we met with her for about an hour and a half, talking about the N-word and the N-word in academics, in academia, um, and other issues that administrators face um, in dealing with um, the N-word in race in schools. And so it was a great, she's, she's wonderful. We're gonna try to bring her back to meet with staff as well. Um, she just has a very wholesome approach and really sees the problems that we're seeing in schools and gives, has ideas and solutions to them. Um, she did a TED Talk for those who are interested. At, again, Elizabeth Pryor, um, if you wanna see it, she's about a 20 minute TED Talk. Um, that is, is, is very good as well. So, um, but anyway, we are creating our own plan because I feel there's an additional need on um, administrators to lead. How do you lead and lead, you know, community that can be divided on different subjects when you talk about um, racism and, and, and diversity and equity in our, in our schools. Um, and we're already seeing that where we get um, different kind of community feedback and how do we lead um, different, you know, to the different sections of our community. So um, we're de still developing that plan because I have some some notes out to different groups in the, in the state to, you know, looking for different um, other, uh, what I was going to say, other um, professional development opportunities and um, offer support to lead us. And I'm hoping from that, I also can get something for school committees as well, because how do you know, what do leaders, what does leadership look like um, when you're looking at, um, you know, anti-racism and that kind of stuff. So anyway, so that's, that's kind of the highlight within there. I went off my screen there. And um, I also, you know, we're going to be putting together a capital list for next year. I'm saying it out loud that we'll be putting together knowing that we may not get a lot of funding on those lists because it's gonna be a difficult year, but I think we still are gonna produce our list, say these are our needs, and you know we may have to be you know, table, putting those on the back burner because we know 22 is gonna be a tough year financially for our towns, but we still gotta keep those lists and what our needs are for the school going forward. So you know, we expect to see those in the coming month as well. All right, if I breezed over anything that you thought was important, feel free to jump on, but I think those are the highlights of it. I, um, Couple of things. First of all, I think that yeah, some your audio is not coming through, Peter. Me? Now we can. I think you're. Now we can. Sorry. I, if I, I can add on um, while Peter figures out his uh, microphone. Uh, I just want to, the efforts of being positive, I want to um, compliment Ben Darius Shelley on all the hard work you guys have done. Um, and I was going to say the level of communication, I think, is good. Um, and trying to follow along with all the emails that you're sending out and all the communication to parents. This is extraordinary uh, work we're all doing right now, extraordinarily hard, um, messy, not perfect. But I think um, we're engaged to service the community as best we can and and i just want to compliment you guys on the on, and chen shelley on the hard work that we've done so far and encourage you to continue the hard work as we go along thanks keith My I, as i said to many parents i, I say in the next the next pandemic we'll do it differently on certain things there are certain things where we made things a lot messier than they had to be but you know it's a lot easier hindsight's easy <laughs> but thank you keith. <clears throat> Am I not coming through? I'm okay? okay. I just wanted to say that I think your idea of meeting with the four town administrators about finances and budgets and stuff like that is fantastic because um, that's exactly the kind of stuff that will you know, ease the process. It's not going to solve a process, but boy, it's going to make figuring things out a whole lot better. Um, and sort of tied in with that was that uh, both Darius and Ben were at the select board meeting Monday last week. Uh, ben to talk about school opening, Darius to talk about uh, the, the, the COVID issue uh, uh, and, and how they're dealing with that. Um, the reception was, I mean, it was, it was great having them there. The reception was great. And then I got a call from uh, one of the select board, Tom Feidenkevich, the next day. And we were chatting and he said, well, the main thing he wanted to say was that he had been 
um, at some point not too long ago, he had been at the school and Ben had given him a tour through all the stuff dealing with the HVAC systems that uh, the, the school was implementing to, to make the building a much safer place. And Tom's an expert in this sort of stuff. And he thought what you were doing was great. Okay. He thought you were, he was so pleased that you were on, as he said, on top of everything. Okay. And um, so I want to, again, give my, like he said, give my thanks to you guys for all through this. There's been the sense of like, you're on top of things, even though I know you guys are working like crazy. So um, again, thank you for that. And thank you just for the general coordination with the towns, because it does smooth stuff a whole lot. Thanks, Peter. I'd like to piggyback on the health and safety theme with, with a couple of questions. Um, one of them is, how are we doing on substitute teachers and coverage as presumably, you know, we're heading into cold and flu season and staff absences may increase? And that could be for Darius or Ben. Ben, how, how is it on the front? So we've, we've been pretty good up to this point. Um, just with the, the various roles, I do have one of our instructional assistants working as a, as a floater to cover any classrooms that um, might need that support for, for a particular day. Um, knock on wood, Sunderland uh, staff, we've been pretty, pretty healthy up to this point. And anytime a staff member has needed to uh, be out, we've been able to cover with the support that uh, we have in the classroom at that time. So every homeroom has a classroom teacher and one or two instructional assistants. So we've been able to um, not really need a lot of subs up to this up to this point this year. We've had uh, from our sub list two different subs come in at, at this point to to provide support in a couple different classrooms and um you know we've we gave them a, a quick orientation about expectations and guidelines and rules to follow and and they've been doing really well so we've been we've been good up to this point if people are interested in subbing we are still collecting applications right and and but the uh one of the big challenges is if a if a teacher if it's their you know fully remote day, how are we going to have a, a substitute wouldn't be able to suddenly learn all of the remote logins and and activities, and that's that's why we've tried to create teaching teams where the or the instructional assistants or another um, faculty member could be taking the lead in. In various activities, or we would also may provide more asynchronous learning activities on that particular day. Thank you. Uh, my other question, and I don't know where in the chain the wall of privacy is on the COVID cases that are in Sunderland, but Darius, I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit more about um, the decision last week to stay open when Sunderland went red. Um, and I'm in particular, I'm wondering if you if there's anything that you know that you can share related to um, we were told that these cases are all affiliated with UMass. To the best of my knowledge, most of Sunderland's UMass residents live in the apartment buildings along with many of our students. Can you tell us anything about that? So um, just so people understand how the decision making went. So, um, you know, I heard that we were going to be going red. Um, you know, we're we are watching the cases in communication with the Board of Health. I did call Caitlin Rock, who's the head of the Board of Health, and I said, listen, you know, what do you think? And she said, you know, Darius, all these cases are UMass students. We had one resident in, um, who is now coming off the rolls. Um, this was at the time that would have been two weeks on, uh, was a, the two weeks you know, separation. So that was a normal resident. And um, she said, these are all UMass students and they're not, there's no community spread. There's no evidence of community spread to any members of our you know, school community. That like, I mean, obviously the UMass students are members of our community, but you understand within their, their cluster. So she's then held, held an emergency board of health meeting to make a decision. I said, you know, talk to them and said, we better get everybody on board on this because it's a, you know, it's a 
you know, it's a difficult, I won't say, I won't say it was a difficult decision, but it was a, a decision you want to make sure you're doing right. So they had an emergency board of health meeting. So I waited by, sat at my desk here and waited. And when I got that information at eight, I then send that email out to families. So that was kind of the process there. I think the, um, I was corrected. I, I can't talk about where the, I don't actually know where the cases are and who they are. That don't, I'm not giving that information. Um, just like I'm not sometimes giving, giving to families, that kind of stuff. I'm only told um, some generalities on stuff. But I was also told, which Jessica, just to correct the generalities, that there are many houses that are rented in the community as well for students. And so to assume that they're in the apartments, in the apartments alone um, is, is to be stereotyping that the students are in the apartments and not um, possibly in houses there with, you know, large groups of students that are in these houses. So I don't know where it is, but I was told that um, when I said, oh, well, the apartments, they said, Darius, don't assume it's in the apartments. And so just putting that out there that it's, you know, they're UMass students and they're, um, as you saw over the, you know, the weekend, we, our numbers have not gone up in Sunderland. Um, and so I think there were two ca total cases in Franklin County as I'm counting from day to day, I haven't seen the report this afternoon. That comes out this tonight. It's supposed to come out forward. It's never come out on time. Um, but so um, I think we're going to see numbers coming back down. We may still be in the red just because that's the way the percentages are in a small town. Um, but it's not because the cases are going up, at least to my knowledge of what I'm, the, the matrix I'm watching. So I, mean, I don't want to be wrong. <clears throat> Thank you. All right. Anyone else? So then I, th I think we uh, say thank you to uh, Ben and Shelly, and uh, we, we do a motion. For oh. I would like you to invite Shelly into the meeting as well. It's going to be Shelly and I. Ben can go. Ben can go. Outstanding. So there is going to, you are going to come back to session afterwards. Um, for those watching, sure, no. however, I will stop the recording. Um, it will continue to live go live stream will continue to go until we come back. We need a motion. Yep. Yes, please. For an executive session, both for the negotiations with Grip Crow Transportation and for teachers and instructional assistants. That's just what's in the agenda. Both of them are there, and I didn't know if we need to have the motion for both for. Pursuant to Mass General Law, thir uh, Chapter 30A, Section 21A2, to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for contract negotiations with uh, yeah, uh, non-union personnel and group co-transportation. Life is good. Yeah, so I, I put them both there because we 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 all, I always leave in the uh, we are continuing negotiating with the teachers, you know. So I, I put them put them both on there. In case you you know, so you don't have to go to you don't have to go to executive session twice. So um, if you if you're going to talk about that, make sure you read that segment. If you're not going to talk about that, I have nothing really to report overall on that. Things are going well there. All right, so I threw out a, a second. Uh, let's see, uh, Keith. Yes. Jessica. Yes. Maisie. Yes. Peter. Yes. And Greg, yes. All right. So we're you're gonna shut off recording and we're, we're gonna go to the other session. Who would make seconded it? Make sure that you completely exit this one so you're not doing what we did once where you're talking on one and still on the other. All right. Okay. So we're all back from executive session. Um let's see. How about uh motion to uh Approve the, the MOA between uh, the school district and uh, Gripco Transportation. So move. Second. Second. Oh, a stand. A couple seconds. All right. Any further discussion? No. Well, it seemed very fair, and, and uh, so uh, let's see. Uh, Peter. Yes. Jessica. Yes. Maisie? Yes. Uh, Keith? Yes. And Greg? Yes. All right. So unanimous. And I think we're done. So send a motion to adjourn. And we adjourn. Outstanding.
Second. All right. Keith? Yes. Maisie? Yes. Jessica? Yes. Peter? Yes. Greg, yes. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Bye.